Hello, YouTubers. Thank you so much for joining me today. Before we start, I just want to say a few words. I know that previously I promised a two week deadline to put out these videos, but unfortunately, with everything opening up and then also with how long it takes me to put these videos together along with the presentation and the script and everything, it actually takes a lot longer than two weeks. So I'm going to try to get these out as soon as I possibly can, and hopefully you guys won't mind the wait. Um, but I have a lot to cover, so I guess I'll just go ahead and start sharing my screen so we can get started. So today we're going to talk about the conic windows in the transept. So before I get started, just to re-outline re basically what the floor plan looks like. So we have the apsis, and in my previous two videos, um, one by myself and one with Lydia, we talked about the windows that are up here in the apsis. Today, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking about the smaller windows in the north and south transepts right here in this area. And so the ones that we're going to refer to are ones above the Holy Name altar, ones over here um, in the H section, and then ones over here around the K section. So let's get started on that part. Okay. So we've got the clear story, which is where all of the stained glass is at. And then we've got at the very top of the window, we've got the quatrefoil, which is the four interlocking circles. We have the tracery, which is right below the quatrefoil and usually depicts angels or some kind of intricate art uh, design. And then We've got the lancet windows, which are the blade shaped windows. So two artists that are depicted in the transepts are Charles J. Connick and Max Ingrand of Paris. So Max Ingrand is the bigger windows and we will go over those in the next video, but I wanted to talk about the conic windows, which are the smaller windows in our transepts. So the first three windows, which are in the south transept, are devoted to the Virgin Mary. When you look up at those windows, you'll see that the prevalent color is blue. Mary is pretty much always depicted in blue and white. The blue color comes from lapis, which is a deep blue semi-precious stone that was greatly admired for its intense color. When ground up, it creates different and beautiful shades of blue. But also when it's ground up, it is more valuable than gold. Now, Mary in art, she's usually depicted as I said, blue or white, but she's also sometimes depicted wearing red. So in these images, red usually symbolizes Mary's humanity. And the blue that she wears like in as a cape or a robe on top of her red is usually a symbol of divinity indicating the divine Holy Spirit which came upon Mary. So let's start with the window that's depicted here. So at the very top in the quatrefoil, you will see a hand pointing downward, and this is meant to be the hand of God. In medieval times, most of the populace was illiterate. So stained glass were, was used to tell stories, and the common people were able to recognize who was in the glass. So in a Gothic church, everything is symbolic. Nothing is left to chance, and nothing is accidental. The same can be said of our belief as Christians. God plays a hand in everything. In the tracery, we see seraphim. Seraphim are the highest tier of angels, those closest to God. They are depicted in art as a head with six wings. Two wings are used to cover their faces and two wings are used to cover their feet in humility upon when they see the radiance of God. And then two are used to fly. Now, Looking at the lancet, we call it a lancet, as I mentioned, because of the blade shape. 
just above Mary's head, you'll see a dove, which, as we know, is a symbol of the Holy Spirit, the divine spouse of Mary. The image is not just Mary, though. It's mother of divine grace. And we know that because in her halo, it says Mater Divina Grazia. Here she carries the infant Jesus wrapped in swaddling clothes. The halo around his head has a cross, which is the means of his death and our life everlasting. Oops, I'm sorry. Then below her, uh, below Mary, is the message the Archangel Gabriel said to her in Latin, Ave Grazia Plena, Hail Full of Grace. And below the message is the Archangel Gabriel himself. We can tell this is Gabriel as he is carrying a fleur de lis, or in the French uh, translation, lily flower. The fleur de lis represents the Holy Trinity as well as symbolizes life, perfection, and light. The emblem is also used to signify heraldry. And then below Gabriel, we see a bowl of roses, and we know that roses are also typically a sign associated with our mother, Mary. So now we move on to the window that's adjacent to Mary, Mother of Divine Grace, and that's the windows including Saints Joachim and Anne. So at the very top in the quatrefoil, we have a fountain of green spray. I'm not entirely sure what this green spray indicates, but from looking it up online, it seems to indicate the Holy Spirit. So the color green is also associated with hope. So I'm assuming this is hope and the Holy Spirit. And I'll talk more about why hope might be one of the reasons this is the particular image up here. Uh, in the tracery again, we've got seraphim. And then in the left lancet, we have Saint Joachim. As Christians, we believe Joachim of Nazareth was the husband of Anne and he was born in Bethlehem. He is depicted in the left lancet and they were the parents of Jesus' mother, the Blessed Virgin Mary. Joachim was a very wealthy man, but he was also a very pious man. He was very devoted to God and gave generously to the poor. Saint Anne on the left, I mean, sorry, on the right of Saint Joachim was actually widowed more than once when she and Joachim married. At their age and not having had any children previously from their previous marriages, there was kind of a stigma to it. And so they were rather upset with God. And, um, and so there's a legend that says that Yakim went into the desert for 40 days during which he fasted and prayed and did penance. Angels appeared to the two of them separately, one to Yakim in the desert and Anne while she was at home, and promised them a child. When Yakim returned to Jerusalem, he saw Anne at the gate and embraced her. There was a belief back then that if an elderly woman who hasn't had any children up to the point gave up hope, but then finally had one, that child would be destined for great things. And we certainly know that Mary was definitely destined for great things. So we talked about Anne and she's carrying a lily, which is symbolic of her daughter's virginity. And then we have Yaquim, and Yaquim is, I'm not really sure what he's holding. He's holding kind of like a staff thing, um, but I'm not sure what that symbolizes in this case. So below Yaquim, we have the child Jesus, and he's surrounded by the tetramorph or the symbolic arrangement of the four evangelists. 
And so we see the human be uh, the human and that one is Matthew. We have the ox, which is Luke. We have the lion, which is Mark, and we have the eagle, which is John. And then underneath that, we have a crescent with lilies in it, which lilies is pure, uh, purity. So then on the Anne side, under Anne, we have the young Mary. Mary as a child, and she's surrounded by lilies and seated on roses, both of which are symbols of her. And then below her, we have a golden temple with a basket of sacrificial doves. And there are kind of two meanings to this. The, the doves are a sacrifice that was given as what uh, was a sacrifice given when Jesus was presented at the temple. And it is also a symbol of St. Joachim. So it can be interpreted either way. Then moving on to the north transept, we have Saints Paul and Augustine. So and then on the opposite side of St. Paul and Saints Paul and Augustine, this is across the nave, the sorry, across the transept. Um, we have Saints Remigius, Saint Boniface, and Saint Patrick. So why are these people depicted in the transept? So I don't know if you rem recall, but back when we talked about the sermon in glass, we talked about how divine grace flowed out from the, oh, so Jesus dying on the cross was the apex of creation, and from his feet there was a cup, and then under the cup there were rivers of divine grace that flowed outward. Pardon me that there's sirens in the background, but um, there were rivers of divine grace that flowed out, and those, sac those rivers led us to the sacraments. And then from the sacraments, we are led to examples of the people who can either bestow divine grace upon us or who are the epitome of, or they are people who embody divine grace, um, like Mary did, um, or who have been bestowed divine grace. That, that's better wording for that. Okay, so, uh, so we have, St. Paul and St. Augustine, Saints Remigius, Boniface, and Patrick. St. Paul, Remigius, Boniface, and Patrick are all known as apostles, not, not the 12 apostles, but they were known as apostles. Paul being the apostle to the Gentiles, St. Remigius, the apostle to France, St. Boniface, the apostle to Germany, and St. Patrick, the apostle to Ireland. The only one depicted here, though, is, that is not an apostle of sorts is St. Augustine. So why is he included in this grouping? So he's depicted here because, as I mentioned, the flow goes from Christ to the sacraments to the ministers of divine grace, which includes our priest. And this has been passed down from generation to generation by the laying on of, her, of hands from Jesus to Peter to every bishop and priest. So when a priest gets ordained, the priests lay their hands on the newly ordained and bestow on them the priesthood. St. Augustine was a big proponent of divine grace as well as a wonderful example of divine grace at work. So, Hence, I think that's why he's included in this. So in the window at the very top, I'm not entirely sure what it is. I think it's an eagle, but I'm not 100% sure because I, can't, I couldn't think what an eagle would potentially symbolize in this particular one. Um, I may have to look into it a little bit more. So I may make a correction to this in my next video. And then again, I'm gonna like probably skip this for the next couple of them, but the tracery is always gonna include seraphim for all of these windows. Then under that, on the left, we have St. Paul. 
He is depicted holding an open book and a sword. Um, and usually if a saint was martyred, then they're depicted carrying the weapon which was used to martyr them. So here, St. Paul carries the sword and he died by the sword. So below him is the text that says, I have fought the good fight, I have kept the faith. And then underneath this wording, we have St. Paul's conversion to the cat. Well, I would say not quite his conversion just yet, but this is where he was being blinded by light on his way to his conversion to the Catholic faith. Uh, yeah, the Catholic faith. So, or Christian faith, I guess, because Catholic wasn't until later. <laughs> but he, he, he basically started to believe that Jesus was the son of God after this, this particular episode. So if you don't know the story of St. Paul, he was previously known as Saul, S-A-U-L, and he was extremely smart and looked to as a role model in the Jewish faith. He had learned of the preaching that these disciples were claiming that Jesus was the son of God. And he was tasked with, he was tasked with, and then made it his own responsibility to persecute these heretics because they were basically, um, tricking people according to what St. Paul believed. He believed that these disciples of Jesus were tricking people into believing that Jesus was the Son of God. However, on one particular journey when he was going to go persecute some Christians he had heard about, he was blinded by a bright light and he heard a voice saying, why are you persecuting me? And then was told to see a follower of Jesus to have his eyes opened. When his eyes were opened, he understood what he was not seeing before. And I sometimes wonder if Paul was not blinded by the light, but by his own humanity, the pride and sin that keeps us focused only on the things we care for. So sometimes like in, in St. Paul's case, he was very knowledgeable. He was looked to as a role model in the Jewish faith. And maybe that blinded him to the truth. So maybe <laughs> that's something that we need to always think about ourselves. Then below St. Paul's conversion, we have the shield containing Trefontan. So when St. Paul was martyred, his head was cut off and Trefontan are the three miraculous fountains that appeared where St. Paul's head bounced after it had been lopped off, basically. Um, so Trefontan is located near the Basilica of St. Paul in Rome. So this is a shield with the symbols of the, of, of the fountains. And then in the Lancet to the right, we have St. Augustine, and he was a bishop and doctor of the church. He's holding an open book and a bishop's crozier. He was the bishop of Hippo Regis, which is now known as Anaba in Algeria. Under him is the Latin text that reads, great are you, Lord, and most worthy of praise. And this is the opening words to his book, The Confession, uh, sorry, Confessions. Under St. Augustine, um, St. Augustine's figure, we have him sitting in a garden and a child there. And that child is basically show, um, singing, take up and read. So this is another scene that's depicted in his book, the Con uh, his book Confessions, where he was a little hesitant to read the Bible. Uh, and so he was sitting by a tree in the garden and he heard like a child's voice singing, take up and read, take up and read. And so then he opened the Bible at that point. And that was kind of like the start of his conversion. 
At the bottom, we have a shield with a heart um, that has arrows across it. Um, and above it is a flame. So this is a symbol of St. Augustine's great love. Then on the opposite side of the transept, we have Saints Boniface and Remigius. I'm sorry, it should be Saints Remigius and then Boniface because Remigius is on the left and Boniface is on the right, but that's okay. Um, so at the quatrefoil level, we see a star with rays. So I couldn't figure out what this meant per se online, but I think it's just Jesus's light shining forth. And that's, that I think that's mainly what it's supposed to represent, but I can look this up some more and see if I could find anything more on it. So on the left, we have St. Remigius and he's got a crozier and he's holding a book with a va with the vase of Soissons on the book. Um, it's a I'm I'm assuming the vase of Soissons was a chrism vessel. Not a hundred percent sure, but Saint Remigius was Archbishop of Reims, and he was an apostle to the Franks. Above his head, we have the fleur de lis, and we talked about the fleur de lis before. But the fleur de lis was also an emblem of King Clovis the first. And it was used as a symbol for his successful reign. And then since then, it has been used by the French royalty and throughout history to represent Catholic saints of France. The Latin text underneath St. Remigius is Psalm 103 verse 20, which in English, uh, it's written in Latin on these windows. Like all of the texts that I've read in English is written in Latin, but the translation in English for this particular one reads, Bless the Lord, all you his angels, mighty power who do his word, hearkening to the sound of his voice. Not a perfect translation, but close enough. Um, underneath the text, we have, um, oh, my bad. It's not baptized. He's not baptizing Clovis the first here. I think this is where Clovis the first, King of the Franks, was presenting the vase of Soissons to the archbishop. So what had happened is that there was a pagan looting of a church and Clovis happened to see the loot and was able to take a bar part of it. And so because he was being converted to, he, he had been converted to Catholicism, he was trying to return the sacred vessel, the vase of Soissons, back to the Catholic Church. And so when he chose to do this, he the one of the guys in the group did not agree with it and so took his sword and smashed the vase of Soissons. And Clovis, although he's here presenting a whole vase, in actuality, he actually presented only the broken vase of Soissons to uh, St. Remigius or Archbishop Remigius at the time. And then later on, when he encountered that person again, he eventually um, basically killed him by smashing his skull, saying, as you did to the vase of Soissons, so I do to you, something along those lines not exactly the best way to get revenge for doing something like that but i guess that was how they handled things at the time <laughs> um and then underneath that you see in a circle um below him um you see the baptism of king clovis so in the left uh sorry in the right lancet we have saint boniface he was a bishop and a martyr and that's why he's depicted holding a book that's pierced with a sword. And he was also a bishop, hence why he's holding a crozier. He was the apostle to Germany. And above his head, I believe, is the Black Eagle of, uh, of Germany. It's an emblem that's used for, uh, for Germany. And then in the Latin text below him, 
there is I think it's Ecclesiastes 65, verse 19, which in English reads, I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people, and the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. And then underneath St. Boniface, we have him baptizing a German. And then below that is St. Boniface's martyrdom. So his martyrdom, the way it happened was that Obviously, he was converting all the pagans in Germany, and there was a particular group of pagans, which I can't remember their name right now, but they ransacked their camp, and Boniface at the time was reading, and so when he, when they ransacked, when they came in to ransack his camp, he raised up the book he was reading in defense and in, and the sword went through the book and killed him instantly. So that's why when we see St. Boniface, his icon depicts a sword piercing the book. So there's another famous, there's a famous story about St. Boniface, which is associated with Christmas. So St. Boniface, is the per reason we have a Christmas tree. Boniface, Boniface was sent to Germany to evangelize the pagans there. And then from his travels, he learned of the village of Geismar, where the inhabitants would gather around this huge old oak tree called the Thunder Oak. And they would do this at the winter solstice and worship the god of Thor. Well, in the process of this, they would also sacrifice a human person. And that usually was a small child. Boniface hoped to convert the village by cutting down this big oak tree, which obviously the pagans believing their god to be superior think, thought that there was no way the god of Remigius could cut down this oak. So Boniface traveled there and he reached just as the sacrifice was about to take place. So they hadn't killed the child yet. He grabbed an axe that was lying nearby and chopped down the thunder oak. The villagers were astonished that he was able to accomplish this. And he just behind the thunder oak, there was a fir tree and he pointed to the fir tree and evangelized using it, saying this little tree, a young child of the forest shall be your holy tree tonight. It is the wood of peace. It is the sign of an endless life, for its leaves are evergreen. See how it points upward to heaven. Let this be called the tree of the Christ child. Gather about it, not in the wild wood, but in your own homes. There it will shelter no deeds of blood, but loving gifts and rites of kindness. So there you have it. Our Christmas tree came about. All right, so the last one, person I want to talk about, um, or the last window I want to talk about, is St. Patrick. So above St. Patrick, we in the quatrefoil, we have the dove of the Holy Spirit. And then above St. Patrick's head, we see a bell. So this is the sweet sounding bell that would announce the preaching of St. Patrick in Ireland. Then under that, we see St. Patrick. And oh, also we see a shamrock by his head as well. So um, St. Patrick was a bishop and he's standing on a bed of shamrocks with a snake gliding to his crozier and up his crozier. So I will have a story about the snake in a second, but um, basically the reason why there is a snake in his image is because St. Patrick was sitting on a hilltop fasting and praying and the snakes were basically trying to attack him while he was doing this. So he got so annoyed, he drove them into the sea where they drowned. And so that's why they, they say that that's the reason why there are no snakes in Ireland. But I don't know if that's actually true or not, but you cannot find snakes in Ireland. So the text below him reads, behold a great priest who in his days pleased the Lord. Then below the text is St. Patrick's vision of children in Ireland crying out, O holy youth, come back to earth and walk once more with us. 
And then there's the Paschal flame on the ground in front of him. So below that vision is, um, oh, sorry, below St. Patrick and his vision is the shield containing St. Patrick's flag, which is St. Andrew's cross, the saltier, with a crown over the shield. So this is the weird because why would St. Andrew's cross be on St. Patrick's flag? Well, it's, um, it's complicated, basically, is the answer. There's a couple of different reasons why this started to be denoted as St. Patrick's flag. But the major reason that I could see online was that it was the Anglo, Eng sorry, the Anglo-Irish Order of St. Patrick that had adopted it many years after St. Patrick had gone. Um, he, he had died, but they, or they adopted it as their own. And so that's why it's associated with St. Patrick. Um, but other than that, there's like another reason why it could potentially be, but this was like the most um, most acknowledged claim for why why it was Saint, denoted as St. Patrick's flag. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. I hope that was informative and I am so sorry for how long it took me to put this together. Um, we are doing in-person tours at St. Dominic's. Right now we are doing um, after the 1130 mass on Sunday, we are doing little 10 to 15 minute tours. And so do come and check that out if you are in the area. If not, I can continue making these videos <laughs> and hopefully they will um, help you to get an idea. But if you ever come visit, definitely check us out and see if uh, you can remember these talks. <laughs> um, also on August 28th, we will be having our St. Dominic's picnic. And just before that, in the morning around 10 or 11, we will be having our St. Dominic's Dominicans tour. So do check that out as well, since we go over a lot of the Dominicans that are located in St. Dominic's. So yeah, um, I think that's all the things that I wanted to mention. So thank you guys for joining. Bye.